in this video we're going to be looking at question 22 of the unit one sample paper and this is part of the edxl ias chemistry course and this question is focusing on topic four which is the alkanes so it starts off by telling us that the alkanes are a homologous series of saturated hydrocarbons so they're reminding us that they are all of course single bonds between the carbons and the first question is looking to draw the displayed formula of three alkanes with the molecular formula C5H12. So, of course, these are all going to be structural isomers. There is no double bonds, so we can't have any geometric isomers. And there's no functional groups, so we can't have position. This is going to be looking at chain isomerism. So, taking the long chains and making them smaller. So, we've got our five carbons in a row. That's the most obvious one to start with. And we draw in all of our hydrogens. We don't get lazy. And we make sure that it's very clear that the bonds are between the carbons and the hydrogens. Now, when we're doing chain isomerism, we take away one carbon from the long chain and we make it into a side chain. And remember, your chains can never be on carbon number one or carbon number four in this case carbon number four. They cannot be at the beginning or the end, they must be in the middle. So I'm going to draw my four carbons and the fifth carbon is now going to be a side chain and I'm going to write that as a CH3. And it's very important that we show that the bond is between the two carbons. And again, I'm not going to be lazy and I'm going to draw in all of my hydrogens. They are looking for full displayed formula here. And then again, I can shorten the chain and make a three carbon chain. I keep one of my side chains as the CH3. I now have to add another and it has to go in the middle. I cannot have any side chains on carbon number one or the carbon at the other end. And again, I'm going to draw in each of my hydrogens. And those are my three isomers. Now you've probably practiced these in class, so this actually should be a nice easy question and it is three marks, one per isomer. For part B, we're looking at the systematic name of compound P and you can see that we've got the, the compound here. Now this is actually to challenge you and to get you to really think here. So I'm just going to make it slightly bigger so that we can see how this breaks down. Now, most people take the longest chain as just the one in the centre. So in other words, these. Now, the problem is that's one, two, three, four, five. But you can see that we have a chain up here. And this is actually part of the longest continuous chain of carbons. So what I'm going to do, if I just take away that dot, this is my longest chain here. So the dots that I've drawn represent the carbons in my longest continuous chain, which is one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. And six carbons, we know, is going to be hexane because it is, unsatur it is a saturated molecule. And we know that each of these lines coming off of the longest chain are methyl groups because they are always going to be our methyls and we need to figure out where we want to put them. So I'm going to number this. I can number it one, two, three, four, five, or six. Or I can number them the other way, which is one, two, three, four, five, and six. And the most important thing is that I have my chains on the lowest possible number. So I'm comparing two and five and three and four. And out of those two numbers, compare the three and the five to the two and the four, the blue numbers are my lowest. So my chains are methyls that are on carbon number two and carbon number four. And I have two of them, so I would call this dimethyl. So now I'm going to put all of this together. And my systematic name is 2,4-dimethyl. Hexane. And that is one mark. Now let's move on to part C. So part C shows us the boiling temperatures of the first four straight chain 
alkanes. So no isomers here, just the straight chains. And we want to predict the molecular formula and the boiling temperature of the straight chain alkane that has five carbon atoms in its molecules. So we have to think, first of all, for the molecular formula, what is the general formula? And we can either work it out using the pattern, or hopefully, you did learn it back in GCSE, you know that for the alkanes, our general formula is CnH 2n plus 2. And if C is 5, then my H is 2 times 5 plus 2. So my molecular formula is C5 H12. The boiling temperature is a little bit more tricky because, of course, you don't know the boiling temperature of the C5 H12 off the top of your head. It's not possible for you to. But what you can do is look at the trend and you will see that the boiling temperatures are becoming higher as your carbon chain gets longer. Now, you may be thinking, well, the number is getting lower, but remember, these are negatives. And as you get a smaller negative number, you're actually getting a higher temperature. So when we look at the difference, from there to there is a difference of 75. From there to there is a difference of 47. And from there to there is a difference of 41.5. So you need a slightly smaller difference between your C4H10 and C5H12 and they will give you a range of answers. So you want to be in this case, what they're looking for in the mark scheme is that you add on somewhere between 25 and 40. So you can pick where you want and I'm just going to put in 30 degrees and that would be a perfectly acceptable answer. For part D, we've got alkanes undergoing incomplete combustion when they burn in a limited supply of air. So an incomplete combustion, very important here. And we want to write the equation of the incomplete combustion of propane, and they tell us C3H8, and we're forming carbon, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and water. So they're telling us everything that we need to make. So let's write it out. We've got C3H8, and we require no state symbols here. We're going to add some oxygen. We make some carbon, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and water. Now, the carbons are balanced out, so they are fantastic. We don't need to touch them, but we do need to balance out the hydrogens and oxygens. So I have eight hydrogens on the left. I only have two on the right, so I need to put a four here. To work out the oxygens, well, I know I have four oxygens coming from the water, two coming from the carbon dioxide, so six in total, plus one more from the carbon monoxide. So I have seven oxygens. And if I then want to balance it, I need to then do seven oxygens divided by the two of the diatomic. So I need to put a three and a half in front of the oxygens. Remember, you can use halves, but only for the diatomic elements. And part two, explain the toxicity of carbon monoxide. Well, this is an, a very nice question for two marks because you've been doing this since GCSE. So you have to think about what is the issue with carbon monoxide? Well, we know that carbon monoxide bonds to hemoglobin. So it bonds to the hemoglobin in our blood and that forms carboxy hemoglobin. Now it's not necessary for you to write out that chemical name but it is useful for you to show the examiner or show whoever is marking your paper that you know that that is the compound that it forms but if you just say that it bonds to the hemoglobin that should be enough and because it bonds to the hemoglobin it stops oxygen bonding and therefore it stops the oxygen from being carried around the body. So by stopping the oxygen from being carried around the body, that is of course an issue because our cells need oxygen in order to be able to respire and to be able to actually work. Therefore, it causes toxicity from the carbon monoxide. So you have to say that it bonds to the haemoglobin and the issue with that is it stops the oxygen from being transferred. Part E is focusing on the specific reactions of the alkanes, and in particular, the reaction with the halogens. 
So propane reacts with chlorine in the presence of ultraviolet radiation, and it starts when we get some chlorine molecules splitting into free radicals, and we get a mixture of being formed. So this is our free radical substitution. And you went through this mechanism before, so you know that it's three steps. You have got initiation, you have the propagation step, and then the last is the termination. And the initiation, which they tell us in the questions, we don't have to write it out, is when we form the free radicals. Now the propagating steps show how we make our chloropropane. So we have our propane, our C3H8, being attacked by one of the chlorine free radicals. And remember, we should always draw the dot to show this unpaired electron. And what this does is it removes one of the hydrogens to make this propyl radical. And it also forms hydrogen chloride. Now this propyl free radical is going to also be very reactive and attack. Now what we need to be careful about is what it attacks. It attacks the chlorine. So your two reactants should each appear, each appear in the propagation steps. One will appear in the first propagation step, which is generally your hydrocarbon, and then the other is the halogen that you're reacting. And this will react by taking a chlorine and forming our C3H7Cl product, and it regenerates that chlorine free radical, which can now go back and redo the first propagation step. And that cycle continues to happen. And it continues to happen until we get to the termination step, which we will talk about further down. So part two is asking to identify the different C3H7 Cl molecules that are produced in this reaction, where we can make two different isomers here. And we have to think about the three carbons with hydrogens and where I can put my Cl. So my Cl could go in the centre like that or my Cl could go on the end like that. Those are my two specific isomers. Now, of course, we don't actually have to draw them out for the question. I'm just drawing them out for the sake of you seeing it. So we have to name these. So this is going to be one chloro propane and two chloropropane. Remember, we do not make three chloropropane because that would just be the same as one chloro. So we've got one chloropropane and two chloropropane. For part two, we want to give a reason why a mixture of the C3H7Cl mixtures is formed. Well, we have to think about what happens in this first propagation step for this chlorine free radical. We can't control what hydrogen it removes. It could remove any of the hydrogens on any of the three carbons. So when we do the first time, it may take it off carbon number one. But when we go back to the propagation step again, it could be taken off of carbon number two. So that attack, removing the hydrogens in lots of different places, will eventually then give us different products. So how can we put this into words? Well, our chlorine radical can remove different hydrogen atoms from the C3H7Cl molecule. Or you could say it could remove from carbon number one and then from carbon number two. As long as your answer clearly shows that it is being removed from different carbon atoms, that is enough. For part four, we want to give a reason why some hexane is formed in this reaction. Well, that's thinking about the termination steps. So if we think about what could actually be reacting, we could take these two propyls and react two of the propyl free radicals together to make C6H12. And that it would be a termination step that would stop. So we could get two propyl free radicals reacting in the termination step. 
Now you can get the mark purely for writing the equation, but it's always good to have an equation along with the words, because if you write both of them, you're just ensuring that you will definitely get the correct answer. And then for the last part, we've got a small amount of product with a molar mass 113 grams per mole being formed, and we want to deduce the structure and the name of a possible product. But well, we have to think about what we've got here. So we know that we're going to have at least three carbons. So that gives us 36. We also know that we're going to have a 35.5, which is one of our chlorines. So this is our carbon, this is our chlorines. So those two things added together, we're still not quite there because this is only going to be around 70. We need to get up to 113. So if I add another chlorine, now we're getting up to slightly higher and that gives us up to 107 and then we can have our remaining spaces on the molecule being filled with our hydrogens. So we need a total of six hydrogens. And each of these added together is going to give us our 113. So what we're saying is that we've got three carbons, two chlorines, and six hydrogens. So we can think about the structure. Now I'm going to run out of space. I'm going to draw the structure down here. I could have my three carbons, my chlorines on the middle carbon, and the second carbon, sorry, the first and the second carbons. I add in my hydrogens. There's my six hydrogens, my three carbons, and my two chlorines. So that would be my structure, that part. And the name of this would then be our one, two, because we're on carbon one and carbon two, dichloro, because I have two chlorines, and the base is propane. So this is basically saying where we get di substitution. Now, when it comes to the actual mechanism, you are only expected to show mono substitution, but you do have to be aware that di and tri substitutions are possible, just depending on the particular reaction. And that is what has happened here. We've had two hydrogens being substituted for two chlorines. And that's how you get two marks. One mark for the structure, one mark for the name. That is all of question 22. That was a slightly longer question, so that's 16 marks, and you can see that it covers all the different aspects of topic four. Check back on the playlist to see the last remaining question for this paper, which is topic question 23, which focuses on topic five.